thanks. Kirsty. Um, last afternoon of time. I'm feeling very powerful. I didn't go to the party last night. Just some kind of first. Um, I went to bed instead. I think it shows I'm getting old, actually. Um, but, yeah, so, um, so yes, our paper, um, I think it's fair to say it's slightly experimental. This is tag. Um, it is of itself a bit of a ramble, I think, um, which hopefully is in keeping with the session. Um, and some of the thoughts in here, as you'll see, are by no means fully formed, and some of them may or may not work. So hopefully you'll, you'll take that in the spirit um, that, we, that we kind of bring it in, and hopefully we'll have some interesting discussion um, as we go on. I just noticed here, actually, we had the teaching art theory yesterday session, and we still got our hands painting of art theory there, which is good. So, um, so anyway, yes, a walk on the wild side, moving through um, through past um, and present environments. I suppose I've kind of gone through the introduction already. Um, so, so I think before we get started, it's, it's important to stress what we're not going to do with this. This is not necessarily a kind of phenomenology in the sense that we're going to talk about our experiences of moving on foot and how that, how we think that interfaces with how we interpret paleoecology and past environments. By that, I don't think we're talking about us having access to what it was like for Mesolithic people to move through Mesolithic woodlands. That's not necessarily what we're talking about at times. It may have that sense to it, I think. Okay, so just to kind of make that, make that clear, or as, far, or as far as clear as it is to us at the moment, some of this is unclear. Okay, so, I didn't stop my watch going. It's okay, we've got that one going. We've got that Excellent, okay. <coughs> Okay, so really this has kind of come out of some of the thinking that uh, Ben and I have been doing, uh, mainly with the article on the left here, of trying to think about how we can start to think about paleo-environmental data and environments in slightly different ways rather than taking a normal traditional approach to them. So today we're really going to be focusing on actually how we can think about walking in relation to environments. But obviously we're not the only people trying to think about these types of things. Um, Gordon Noble's book has recently come out as well. Um, and again, this is looking at the relationship between people and a very particular environment, woodland. And um, actually most of what we're talking today is about moving through woodland, really, isn't it? Or really trees, yeah. or at least that um, vegetated landscape that's not just grass. So it's a bit more complicated than that. It's probably the best place to go for yeah. So hopefully kind of picking up some of these, these ideas in, in Gordon's book, which I've not actually finished yet, I must admit, but um, certainly the idea of trying to bring together these, these ideas um, that kind of sit in that awkward space between, I suppose, archaeology and paleoecology and themes, themes within that. So yeah, just to clarify, and the risk of us descending into a kind of second year introduction to environmental archaeology lecture, God help us all, even though it is tag. So the kind of data sets we're mainly kind of referring to or alluding to today are mainly in the form of uh, panological data, so pollen grains such as, such as this one on the left here. Um, of course, there's other kind of proxies that we use to reconstruct past environments and past woodlands. So most typically, for example, insect remains, so fossil beetle remains, we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, and in kind of the rare occasions where we get the actual physical remains of woodland surviving in in wet places such as peat bogs or, uh, or foreshore environments such as such as this image there. So that's kind of the sort of data that we're we're engaging with, if you like. Um, and kind of moving on from that, as paleoecologists, we you know we reconstruct past environments, whatever that means. We were just talking about this in the previous session. Um, past environments don't exist, obviously, other, other, other than in the present, other than the way we kind of bring them into being through our reconstructions. A large part of that is imaginative, and it's also, we suggest, it's also embodied, and that would be a theme within archaeology, but we tend not to think or talk about <coughs> paleoecology as being kind of embodied in that interpretive sense. So, again, something I'm going to refer to is, is kind of these issues of movement in the past. Again, this is not phenomenology that you think, but the way that we think about movement through woodlands and how our own kind of movement in the present through different environments, how that, that kind of loop works, if you like. Okay, so we can return to this, this later because a lot of what we think we know, this is another issue about past environments, um, there's a lot we don't know about past environments, and a lot of that is, is related to some of these issues to do with how people in the past may have moved through landscape as well, and the implications of that for the archaeological record. Okay. So, what the hell? Does any of this have to do with movement on foot, really? Um, and the point that I think we're going to try to get through throughout Mesa's presentation is we have our experience of this on the one hand, uh, we have our data on the other hand, so we have things like pollen diagrams here, 
Um, but actually what we're often doing is moving between these things. It's not a moving from one to another, but we will, our experience of moving through these landscapes will inform how we interpret something like this pollen diagram. So both Ben and I could look at a pollen diagram and interpret it very differently, not because the species are different, but because of our experiences of how we're interpreting that. So I suppose what we're going to do is actually just delve into that process a little bit more, especially in relation to um, our experiences of moving through these <coughs> environments. So we'll start with me. This is literally uh, just a short video. Can I turn this down at all? of um, walking in a wooded environment. And I suppose some of the things I want to really get across with this, is, uh, <coughs> taken from this is what I'm looking at, so occasionally I will stop and look around. This is not a heavily wooded landscape, but already you, there is a fell side behind here, which is only just starting to come into view now that you can see. Um, also this idea of um, earlier on in the season when all the leaves cover that path, that path will totally disappear depending on things like seasonality here. So already we've got a huge, well not a huge amount, but we've got things that we see, that we experience, that we don't see in our pollen records. Things like sight lines, things like seasonality, um, the small micro um, topography, and these are themes that we're going to come back to throughout. Really. I should finish in a second. And noises as well. We don't often think about the, um, our footfall when we're going through these environments. What noises do they make? What noises do they make on leaves, on broken twigs, on grass, on gravel, beaches, etc.? They're things that we experience in ourselves but we don't see necessarily in our data. Okay, so we're also going to draw a bit of a distinction here between the session talks about walking but there's other ways of moving on foot and obviously... Running is another way, and all kind of all shades in between that. And something that has kind of started to inform the way that I think about landscapes and paleontological data is the fact that um, I'm an orienteer, much like bad orienteer, quite frankly. I get lost quite a lot in woodlands. But what I found with that experience, if this is an orienteering mode, do we have any orienteers in the room? Anyone who's never orienteered at all? Yeah, a couple, okay. So, so it's interesting, you probably can look at this map if you've orienteered and, and you can kind of read it in a way that perhaps you can't if you don't know what you're looking at. Rather like a pollen diagram, actually. But the thing about orienteering maps is because they're designed for you to navigate on foot, they have features on them that you wouldn't find, obviously, on an OS map. So, for example, we have features such as, uh, just here, I don't know how we can see, these small depressions in the ground, pits, um, vegetation, for example, the dark green here shows very dense, impenetrable vegetation that you cannot move through on foot. You can obviously pick out pathways here as well. Um, micro topography, so the contours are at five metres. And what you find when you're orienteering is that you tend to be navigating by these kind of features, so you'll often be navigating by the vegetation, you'll be navigating by uh, the, the contours, or you're going upslope or downslope. So it, kind of makes you think again in the sense about what we don't know about in our terms of our paleontological reconstructions. We tend to talk of dense woodland in the past and the Muslim talk of dense woodland. We don't really know quite what that means, okay? And that's problematic because when it comes to thinking about Mesolithic people and how they move, move through landscapes, monumentality, these sorts of issues are kind of related to these kind of levels of data that we, we don't really have. But we're bound to think about by this kind of experience of landscape. So again, it's just there's a very quick video here. And again, running through woodland is a very different experience um, compared to um, moving on foot through woodland. Um, small features within the landscape, small features of the, the understory vegetation will dictate how and where you move. And this isn't even particularly dense woodland. So again, I think we're drawing a distinction here between walking and between running in different shades of movement within that. I do like the way the shadow comes in that here. Okay, so these kind of woodlands we have in the present day, they're probably very poor analogues to the kind of woodlands that were present uh, in the prehistoric period. So this is just an aside really, again as part of this kind of ramble through, ramble through this issue is, why are people in prehistory always walking or possessing? Why is no one ever moving quickly? Or at least I'm not aware of, of any accounts that discuss people perhaps moving quickly. So when we see phenomenological accounts of movement, it's always a stately procession. It's almost kind of this Victorian idea of perambulating. Where, is, where are people moving fast in prehistory? We might talk about curses monuments and people moving along those. Why are they processing? 
Why are they not running? I don't know the answer to that. Again, we have this famous Mortimer's reconstruction of the, um, of the sweet track, and I think it's been pointed out before, you know, the, the, the manful, you know, the kind of family unit, there's a man at the front, he's striding uh, forward purposefully, kind of moving in a very particular way. Okay? And again, that, that is interesting in terms of how we think about monuments. Anyway, that is a, very much a kind of an aside, I suppose. Okay, so I suppose what's really underpinning this, and we've um, both spoken about this before, so apologies if people have heard us um, talk about this, but really what we're trying to do is we're trying to move from our data, our hard, um, stabilised ideas over here, um, to actually our, what we experience is more kind of soft, imaginative, embodied experience. And the idea that actually, ultimately, all interpretations are soft because they require some sort of imaginative engagement with that data of how that becomes a, a reality, I suppose, in the past. And there's different ways of us imagining that. So, so yeah, I suppose, again, this is coming around the loop. You know, it, it, you, you might, again, if you're not a paleoecologist um, or if you use paleoecological data, um, you might expect that it's obvious how we interpret problem diagrams and that we... Um, have huge amounts of information about past woodlands and past environments. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. We know more things about some things than about other aspects of past landscapes, as I've just referred to. I think underpinning this is a kind of a problem with, or an issue with paleoecology that, that kind of came this morning, and that is the fact that we say it's obvious how we interpret data. Lucas' quote is self evident truths are often the most dangerous. So I suppose we're kind of moving, moving kind of on our kind of wander through this kind of subject towards ideas of kind of epistemology. Um, and behind this is also the fact that to be a paleoecologist, um, you need to be trained, you need to have experience. Okay? And that's, that's self-evident. So there's a pollen grain here. Does anyone in the room know what pollen grain this is? Andy, don't answer. <laughs> 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 is it Quercus? It is Quercus, excellent. <laughs> okay, so does anyone know what Quercus is? Now let's move, move up the next level. <laughs> Oak. Oak, excellent, yeah, of course. Yeah. But if I put that up, then what, what's that? <laughs> So, cool. Okay, so the point you're making here is an obvious one, perhaps, but you need this kind of loop. You can't interpret this without knowing it comes from that. So we always have this kind of imaginative loop. So when as a paleoecologist, when you see this, you think some kind of form of that. So we always have this kind of interpretative loop going on that we think, to an extent, we're suggesting this idea of movement kind of comes into, in a sense, movement, but in terms of some of these interpretations and these issues we were men mentioning. Okay, um, I suppose, kind of should move on yeah. a little bit. Um, so ultimately, all of our kind of visualizations of past environments, whether these are kind of these computer generated ones, VR ones, or these kind of imaginative um, paintings, reconstructions, drawings, these are all uh, some form of discursive construct. So we always have this kind of loop going on, this imaginative kind of engagement that again relates to the body. It's not saying that. Okay, okay I'm going to skip that one. Um, okay, so we have different types of environment, and again, it's just this idea, really, these slides are showing different types of environments and how you would have moved through them, uh, whether we're looking at a d dense, dark woodland or whether we're looking at wide, open landscapes. But um, what I'm going to talk about now is actually talking about a landscape that I looked at uh, quite a few years ago now for my PhD, <coughs> but I'm going back to this to say, right, we're in the Alps, we're in the French Alps here, we have a, a 18th, 19th century idea that high altitudes are somewhere that you didn't go to, um, that they were dark, they were dangerous, they were unwelcoming, they were full of risk. Um, this uh, is associated with those <coughs> attitudes that have kind of come through, and you can see that with the high altitudes there, surrounded in cloud, um, but yes, it's the valleys that are settled. Uh, with, say, the work I was doing with Kevin Walsh and uh, Florence Moxie out there, we were really starting to challenge this. So when we start to look at the archaeological data, I'm not going to go into massive amounts of detail, but we have a, a profile here, an altitudinal one. In the early Bronze Age, we actually see that all of our archaeology is actually focused in the high altitudes. Um, in theory, there's a burial site down in the valley, but that's an antiquarian record. No one really quite knows where this is. The one, two, three, four, five um, are all the paleoecological sites that we looked at for this valley at different altitudinal ranges. And again, for this, what we start to see is the open landscape, the pastoralism happening at the top, but very little down in the bottom, which is fine. There's nothing different there. Um, and that's probably where I stopped with my thesis. But actually, what was underpinning a lot of this and what I find quite interesting now is that alongside this work, I was also going out and we were what was called um, prospecting. Um, in a, both in high, mid um, and low altitude areas. So we were walking across large tracts of this landscape. You're moving all the time. You're moving through high altitude areas with no trees, but also you're also navigating some of these really um, steep valleys. You would not have moved through 
they didn't look like this in the Bronze Age. More than likely, they were far, far, far more vegetated. So, so that is also starting to feed into your interpretation now. By the time we get through to the medieval period, we're seeing far more open landscape and we start to see cultivation and far more activity in the bottom of the valley, something that we're more familiar with today. But all of this is happening on a very generalising level and this is where environmental data um, really fits in and where we're also, I think other people have touched on this as well, this issue of scale, whether it's temporal or spatial scale that we're looking at. Um, certainly, in this, if anyone was in the environmental narrative session this morning, we were talking about this, <coughs> something that Alistair Whittle picked up in Monday's session as well. How do we go from these generalising environmental narratives to the particularising as well? How do we see these micro-topographies? How do we see the seasonality in this? Apart from through ourselves and through our interpretation is one thing that I suppose we're starting to argue. So I don't have an answer for it, really more just these are the things that we're trying to think through and try and bring in in different ways but really to do this we have to be able to think and we have to put ourselves into this interpretation which means we have to admit that we do that we are directing these interpretations and that we will see things differently and to a certain extent that's okay as long as we're really acknowledging that okay so think you know think things that we miss so really just to kind of leave you with a few thoughts and as you can see this is kind of open-ended we don't really have any conclusions as such we're just trying to kind of think through some of these issues and I suppose trying to kind of expose and consider some of the interpretive process in paleoecology. So as, as we just said, paleoecology uh, interpretation is embodied and this links to what we were saying about movement and how we think about our reconstructions, our different reconstructions of past landscapes, what they were like. And again, not in phenomenology, but that does make us think about people in the past and how they moved or didn't move through those landscapes. Um, there are various things that affect our present day movements through a landscape and these, as Susie was just saying, these feed into our interpretations in a variety of, of subtle ways. Um, and these are there, they're there somewhere, even if we don't foreground or acknowledge them. And again, and these are often the things as archaeologists we might be interested in about microtopographies, for example, about clearings in woodlands, about where monuments are located and so forth. Um, and really, I suppose what we're trying to do is, trying to, as I say, trying to foreground some of this by trying to make some of these processes more transparent. Um, in this case, I say, drawing explicitly on movement through a landscape and our experience of that. Potentially, it gives us space to um, interrogate some of these ideas and think about these in terms of our practices as paleoecologists. Um, thank you for listening. Hopefully, that made some sort of sense. Thank you. Thank you.